Welcome to this week's Five Minutes of American Literature. Let's talk about captivity narratives. Captivity narratives are a very American genre of literature. They're not an American creation, but American colonial literature produced a lot of them, partly because lots of imperial conflicts produced lots of captives who lived to publish their tales. American captivity narratives also tend to be different from other works in this genre, because they're so often told not by male sailors or adventurers, but by women who were caught in the crossfire of border wars. They're the stories of regular wives and mothers and girls who were home minding their own business when they were brutally snatched away from their communities. This style of captivity narrative tends to go like this. The capture of a helpless victim who is ripped from everything she knows by wicked captors, a period of breakdown and self-doubt in which the victim believes that all is lost and she might as well die or submit, a spiritual comeback period in which the victim feels her core identity being challenged and resolves to defend it, and finally a redemption in which the victim regains her freedom and reflects on the growth that she experiences during her ordeal. We will focus on the story that set the template for the American captivity narrative, a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mary Rowlandson. Rowlandson was a minister's wife who was living in Lancaster, Massachusetts when it was attacked by the Wampanoag in the middle of King Philip's War. She was taken captive along with some other survivors of the battle, including her children. After seeing her community destroyed and her neighbors killed and her youngest daughter die in her arms, Rowlandson spent about three months as a prisoner of war until she was ransomed to her husband for 20 pounds. It's easy to forget that her story is taking place during a war because after her description of the Lancaster raid, she rarely talks about her captivity in that context. Instead, her narrative becomes reminiscent of the story of Jonah and transforms into a combination of adventure tale and spiritual autobiography. After a period of shock and deep depression, she reaches a turning point that reminds her of who she is and where she came from. She gets back in contact with her son and she's given a Bible by one of her captors. As she searches her Bible for answers for why God has let this happen to her, she decides that she had grown too lax in her faith before her captivity too forgetful of God's commandments, too inattentive to the state of her soul. Therefore, God has stripped her of her worldly attachments so that she will rededicate herself to her faith. Through this theological lens so often employed by Puritan authors, the Wampanoag go from being enemy combatants in an earthly conflict to being instruments of God in a spiritual test. Rowlandson picks herself up and gets to work. She reads her Bible to reaffirm her Christianity. She devotes herself to English domestic tasks like sewing linens. She starts standing up for herself whenever one of the Wampanoags gets on her case about something. Over the course of her captivity, she participates in her captor's society and economy and earns the respect and even friendship of some of them, which she returns to an extent. However, she continuously reminds her readers that she hates the Wampanoag, that she considers them heathens and savages, and that she does not identify with them. As a captive, she may be in the Wampanoag's world, but not of it. And after she's finally released, even though the memories of her ordeal continue to haunt her, she tells us that she wants to be grateful for the experience, since it's made her a better Christian and a better Englishwoman. However, that backdrop of war never goes away. And it creates a tension in her story that keeps it from fitting neatly into the conventional captivity narrative template. Her explanation for her ordeal, that it's a test from God, does not scale up very well. At several points in her story, she hints at some serious doubts in her people, which she calls remarkable passages of providence. She can't ignore the impotence of the English against the Wampanoag when it comes to protecting their people. She feels compelled to ask, if we're the superior civilization, then why are the savages burning down our villages and taking our people? If we are destined to have this land, why does it hinder us and help the Wampanoag? If we're on God's side and have his favor, then why are we losing? She tells us that it must not be God's will that the English should have victory yet, and that she should accept that and marvel at God's mysterious ways. It's an interesting way of demonstrating her faith for her readers and highlighting that there are no good answers to those questions. As a result, the problem of English impotence hangs like a bad smell over Rowlandson's personal narrative of faith. 
It's a smell that wafts through a lot of late 17th century Puritan literature. And it connects Rawlinson's narrative with much different works like Cotton Mather's Wonders of the Invisible World. As a Puritan scholar who came from a long line of distinguished ministers, Mather projects the authority of a man who considers himself a defender of the faith. He wrote his history of the Salem witch trials at the request of the judges not long after that ugly episode, and he offers us a firm, academic-sounding validation of those trials. Mather had his own explanation for why the Puritans seemed to be losing the Holy War for the New World. But like Rowlandson, he can't ignore the fact that Massachusetts is a colony in crisis. It's been altered by expansion and torn up by war and plagued by internal divisions. The Puritans may have stayed dominant in Massachusetts well into the 18th century, but with Rowlandson and Mather, I get the sense that many Puritans felt their power slipping away and they were not ready to let it go. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you have questions and happy reading. Don't let hard texts get you down.